to wonder at beauty, stand guard over truth, look up to the noble, resolve on the good. This leadeth us truly to purpose in living, to right in our doing, to peace in our feeling, to light in our thinking, and teaches us trust in the workings of the Creator, in all that there is, in the widths of the world, in the depths of the soul. Rudolf Steiner Welcome to the Lost Traveler podcast. I'm your host, Henry Cameron Allen. And this is an ongoing series in honor of Indigenous Peoples Month, which was November. But uh, we're going to be continuing it into December, which is very exciting because the incredible guests that we've had uh, have been uh, sort of elevating our conversations on universal life skills in a way that I didn't anticipate. And I'm really happy that my co-host, Chief Midega of the Pembina Chippewa is here and is co-hosting again for this series. Welcome. It's good to see yeah, always, you and hear you again. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And I'm super excited to uh, welcome our, our guest tonight, who's Sarah Kupke, who I met uh, back in 2018. At the time, she was the head of the Sindelfingen campus of the International School of Stuttgart, which was a tremendously unique experience in my life to see a different methodology to educating young adults and viewing the world. And along the journey, along the path, Sarah became just a real close dear friend. She even somehow got my, my grandmother to give her the most beautiful, the most beautiful solid bone deer necklace that she's wearing tonight. Thank you, Sarah, for being here. Yeah, thank you very, very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Having listened to your other um, um, three podcasts in the series. I am very touched to have been invited. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you again and have you here. And uh, let's start with sharing a little bit about your background, um, how you found yourself where you are. Uh, you were born in England, is that right? Yes, I was born in England in 1960 to um, um, parents who um, were traveling around a lot, um, not quite uh, as much as you, Henry, or not as far as, not, not far afield as you as a child, but certainly very often. I think I've moved about 20, I'd, I'd moved about 23 times before I came to live in Sindelfingen, and bearing in mind that that was at the age of 30, it shows that I moved a lot. But very often within the British Isles, I spent three years, however, in the Rhineland of Germany, um, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s with my family and um, and then went back to Great Britain uh, to boarding school because at that time there was no continuity in the, uh, you know, with, with changing schools all the time. So had that extraordinary experience of, of boarding, which I think, again, is something which uh, Mide and I, um, um, you know, have, have talked about and the pros and cons of, 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 boarding school situations. Um, and I think during my childhood, um, which was very blessed, I've just been talking to my younger brother this evening, um, um, by the fact that we both felt, you know, that we had um, parents who were not perfect in every way, but by golly, we knew we were loved. And uh, I think that's probably something that has <clears throat> influenced me all the way through my life, is knowing that I was loved by my parents and I think in many ways it, it, it's been advice that I've given parents um, that I've worked with of children in school all the way through that we can go through thick and thin we can go through all sorts of difficulties but if if we have that solid basis of knowing that we're loved by our parents it's um it, it's an extraordinary gift in life Truly um, true. and <clears throat> one which many of my friends at school did not share, and lots of them wanted to be adopted by my parents. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a perfect childhood in any way. We were, we were um, you know, very, very normal people, but it was, uh, it was very special to have given us that foundation. During my childhood, I um, observed a lot. I saw a lot. I wondered a lot. I um, explored and um, ha had the great fortune of being able to develop my imagination. And when I went on to study after school, um, I was really torn between whether I wanted to go into education or whether I wanted to go into the theatre. And so I had the joy of being able to do both. I um, 
I, uh, I, I was able to uh, study education as one part of my degree and theatre as the other part. It, it wasn't theatre and education, but it was these two, you know, uh, two rungs at the, uh, then it was at the University of London, which was part of the Roehampton Institute in London. And um, uh, followed these two paths and uh, ended up going into education um, um, not by mistake, as many of my colleagues I hear, you know, uh, suddenly found that they had a love of working with children, but really quite consciously and intentionally going into education. So I was at the Froebel College, which um, um, was named after Friedrich Froebel, who was um, an educator 300 years ago in Germany, working with young children. He coined the phrase kindergarten mm. and uh, would work with the children in, in the garden and they would grow things and they would dig the earth and they would get dirty and they would discover and they would find out and they would explore. And he created a set of wooden games for them to play so that they were, they were structured games that um, allowed the children to develop their ideas and to develop their thinking. And so I was um, very excited in the 1970s and 80s, uh, thinking about the whole idea of, at that time we talked about discovery learning. These days we talk about inquiry-based learning perhaps. Right. Um, and, and I was also interested in the idea of perhaps pursuing theater but I went into uh, the world of education and I rather flippantly perhaps talk about um, in 1990, after I had actually done a, a tour of Italy with a theatre company for four months and I came back to Britain and I was working at the University of London as a, a lecturer at the university teaching um, pedagogy, teaching education. And I rather flippantly say that um, London was too small for Margaret Thatcher and me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But there's a grain of truth in it. Hmm. I was deeply disturbed by what was happening to the education system at that time and seeing what was um, happening to teachers and heads of schools um, and decided to leave the country for a couple of years, hope that she was popped off her pedestal and that we got some other politics in there and said, you know, I'll come back when they've sorted it out. And I suppose the rest of the story is they didn't sort it out. And so I stayed on in Germany. I um, had the great joy of meeting my husband, uh, Joachim Kupke, who's a, a photorealistic uh, painter mm. and has earned his um, income all the way through his life through the vocation of, of artwork. He's also a musician and, and writes his own songs and, uh, and plays with a band that he's now played with for over 40 years. And uh, Mide um, uh, came to one of the concerts and uh, um, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, unfortunately the last two years have been a little bit tricky from that point of view with, with the COVID, but um, stayed on and had the joy of being able to work at the International School of Stuttgart for a few years. I then went off and did some other things, including, um, three and a half years of working at a Waldorf school, a Rudolf Steiner school. Um, the Sch Rudolf Steiner schools come from the Stuttgart uh, area, the, um, the first schools, and so that was a, a very different educational experience and quite an um, exciting uh, opportunity to see a different way of working. Um, and then um, to cut a long story short, I then I, at some point was asked if I would um, uh, be the founding head of a new international school. And um, so uh, we started off in Karlsruhe, but this became the International School of Heidelberg, um, which was um, uh, an extraordinarily uh, exciting opportunity, uh, but it was away from home. And um, so after about four years, I came back to Sindelfingen when the Sindelfingen campus of the International School of Stuttgart was uh, founded and um, had the very great privilege of being able to work with a team of people that grew over the years and children who were pioneers in their um, enthusiasm for creating uh, a learning environment, which um, was something special and is something special. And my successor has taken it over and uh, is, is continuing to grow this lovely little garden of learning um, in a very beautiful way. So there we are. That's a, a, a quick sort of overview. <laughs> I had the tremendous privilege of watching uh, your husband, as well as you, do a reading when uh, when they had their their concert, and the 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 quality of his art artistry is just astounding. And he actually has his own studio, 
And some of the things that he does are just so remarkable that it, I, I know a little bit of that probably moved into, it influenced you and moved into the school as well. Something that stood out to me uh, quite vividly when I first came into your campus, your school, is that uh, the, the level of creativity was just, it was a sensory explosion. <laughs> and, and I remember that from when I was a kid. You know, you talked about uh, uh, feeling loved by your family and feeling supported. And then it didn't matter where you were at because you were, as, as the, the Sarah Kupke I've got to know, and is it doesn't matter which, which earth you're put in, you're going to bloom. And, and so I had this remarkable teacher in my first uh, probably nine years in school. I had, I had one that was just incredible. And he did something like that in his classroom. And he was unique in that because the American model is very industrial. It's very, it's almost like you're, you're sending kids into a manufacturing environment of everybody has to be the same. But this guy, Mr. Needham was different and he had plants and all the walls everywhere had to be covered with whatever you were working on. And, and your creativity, your growth was based on you as a unique individual. And he wasn't afraid to say, I love that picture and I love you for making it. And, and when I came into your school, Sarah, I still, I will never forget the day when Ann buzzed me through the door and I walked in and the first thing I saw was almost every single wall and piece of glass covered with something that these children had made. And Henry, this stuff was psychical. It was constantly being updated. It wasn't something that was just put up. It was nonstop. And, uh, and I just want to, you know, thank you for being like that in those children's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a very common history, Sarah, you and I, both traveling so much in our foundation years, finding ourselves in education. I never expected to, to go into education either, uh, but also in theater, training in theater and, uh, and how, they, how one informs the other. You know, I was, uh, I was working in a, a children's bookshop in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I had many teachers come in as clients asking me for what was new, what was fresh. Uh, maybe they were looking for something specific for their curriculum. And uh, one of the, uh, the teachers who I became close with, Gay Steelstra, I'll always remember her. Uh, she was a teacher at uh, a Steiner school, Waldorf school in Minneapolis. Now I've traveled the world. I've traveled in cultural circles my whole life. I had never heard of Rudolf Steiner. I had never heard of Waldorf education. And so she told me a little bit about it and then came in one day and she said, uh, you mentioned you're a theater artist. I said, yes, I am. And she said, well, do you ever do residencies in schools? I said, from time to time I do. She said, well, our theater teachers are, are going on a bit of a hiatus and we're looking for someone to, to bring in as a replacement for that time. Would you be interested? I said, well, sure, sure, Let, I'd love to meet them. And so they had lunch with me and, and we talked before I ever saw the school. And we just needed to see if we hit it off. And, uh, and we did instantly. And uh, they're still to this day, very good friends. And, um, and then they took me on a tour of the school. And I had a very similar experience me day as you did uh, walking into the international school. Art, children's art everywhere. Every classroom was beautiful and the colors were soft. There was no fluorescent pinks and yellows and greens. It was all very muted and soft and comfortable. And they were beautiful. There were live plants. Some classrooms had live animals as well. There was always a nature table in the corner of the room to keep children connected to their, their natural selves and, and their connection to the natural world. And, um, and as I, I uh, got more involved with the education, I was just like a sponge, 20, just learning so much. I started in the early childhood, then I went on to substitute teach in various other classes. And um, in the end, I became an admissions director for two schools, a high school and a, and a lower school. And it's very interesting to me how the, the foundational story uh, gets sort of uh, watered down in terms of how the movement started. It came about at the same time as Montessori, didn't it? Um, 
and it, it was because Steiner was was uh, approached and asked to start the school by an industrialist, by a man who, I mean, Emil Moltz, who was the director of the Waldorf Astoria cigarette factory in Stuttgart. And uh, Steiner was on a lecture tour around Europe talking about educational reform, among other things. And uh, Moltz was so moved by what he was saying about uh, child's education uh, that he asked him to help create this, the Waldorf Freie Schule in Stuttgart in 1919. And now there are over a thousand schools around the world. It's a, a quiet movement, but a, an important one, I think. That's right. And I think that um, uh, it, it's, it's interesting that uh, the Waldorf uh, schools have such a close connection to nature. Um, because of um, because of the work they did with with uh, through the anthroposophical movement and 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 working uh, with Stein's influence there and so you know one of the things that was very um, um, was very interesting to see with the children that we were working that I was working with at the um, the Waldorf School in Burblingham was that um, you know th it was really important for them to see the process all the way through um, so for example uh, you didn't. Um, just tell children how bread was made. You, uh, you know, planted the grain. You tilled the, gra the ground. You planted the grain. You um, nurtured the plants. Uh, <laughs> they went right the way through, yeah. right the, through the summer. Then, um, with uh, uh, these, these, uh, with, with, with the plants growing, with the, um, and then, and then coming after the summer, um, either you got to harvest them. Or the wild boar had uh, had uh, come with their big strong snouts and already uh, um, ploughed up the ground. In which case, you also learned about what happens when it goes wrong and that ev not everything is perfect and so on. But anyway, they would then take the grain, they would harvest the grain, they would um, um, grind that down into wheat flour uh, in their little coffee grinders, you know. Yes. Make coffee grinders, and then they would um, eventually then bake the bread. So they knew where bread came from. They knew that it wasn't, you know, there's the stories we always hear about children, you know, well, I know where it comes from because it comes from the supermarket or, or they, they, they went through the process or by the time they got into their fourth grade, uh, it was important that they built something and they didn't just build um, little uh, cardboard box um, models on their tables. They'd go out and they'd find out what it's like to pick up a brick and to mix cement and have to, you um, um, mount the bricks on top of one another so that the wall would be stable and wouldn't just fall down um, uh, because it had been um, incorrectly built and they they uh, and, and what it felt like to get your fingers dirty and to and 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 raw from the uh, from the materials that you were working with um, and then the pride of we built this hut which is now used for the tools for the garden, for example. So there was this, this, you know, based in on, on practicality and reality. And then the other side, I think, of the Rudolf Steiner movement, which was quite interesting, was um, that um, he talked about institutions being very similar to um, people in the way that they grow and how they develop and that this first seven years, and this is, I know that media will be nodding away like mad here with this number seven coming up again. Um, but the first seven years of an institution are formative and what you, what you, the seeds you grow, you, you, you sow at that time are what, what grow in the institution. And, um, and, and I've, having been a founding head of, of a, a, a couple of schools now, plus the Steiner School was only four years old when I uh, joined it as well, we were very conscious of wanting to lay our foundations in order to be able to, our, our, our institution to grow just as a child grows. So we were just having this conversation today about foundations of houses, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in institutions, right? Or whether it's a structural, building. It's all about the foundation. It's all about having as strong a foundation as possible. If you start with a shaky foundation, that house is doomed to collapse in on itself at some point. You can go in and reinforce it and rebuild it and all that, which is very costly, uses a lot of time and resources, right? And so if we're looking at the education of children from the foundation years to build as strong a foundation in self-awareness and their connection to the rest of the world, cause and effect, 
right? Science begins in pre-K with making bread and carving, you know, wood and hammering and, and architecture and all of that. Shadow and Light LLC was established by Dave Roberts and Reverend Patty Farino, co-authors of When the Psychology Professor Met the Minister. Their mission is to empower individuals to transcend life challenges by integrating spiritual practices with psychology to achieve peace. They are available for individualized spiritual counseling, virtual or in-person presentations and workshops to universities, organizations, and other interested groups, virtual or in-person book club meetings. For further information, go to psychologyprofessorandminister.com. Mide, talk a little bit about the importance of education in your development. Yeah, I had the very interesting opportunity to view life from that angle, that paradigm of coming from really a broken community, a broken home, broken family, uh, you know, and these were these were outcomes that were that were due to policies of, regarding education uh, uh, related to the indigenous peoples of the Midwest and the Rocky Mountains of the United States, where, you know, and, until, a, a, you know, up until a child was seven years old, you know, they were just taken from families and put into boarding schools. And I think that the, the difference between that model versus maybe perhaps what was occurring in England is it was st- specifically designed to completely remove the familial structure, everything that held you together, your language, your family. And so, so I was the first generation that was able to kind of walk into a regular school. These things didn't end to the 70s. I could go into a regular school and participate, but it didn't remove what I had to go home to every day. And so, so one of the, the ways that I really benefited is I think there was a, a, an age that occurred in the 80s, the shift that occurred where educators started seeing that these weren't, these weren't assembly, assembly line cars that are all the same, but these are unique personalities. And if you lay a proper foundation, and I would say in the first seven years in school, and you care about them as an individual, that you don't know the type of life that they may achieve or the, 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 the magic they may do with the creativity that they, that they perform in the world. And so, you know, I remember I had a unique experience uh, when I was in grade one, I, I actually fell from a distance about eight. And this kind of will highlight just, you know, the, the, the power, the power that an educator has in the life of an adult. Every adult can tell you who their kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade teacher is. And I would say 99.97 canon. Why? Why? Because they viewed them as who they are and not as an assembly line machine. And I had fallen from about an eight foot distance. This is about maybe two and a half meters in, in European metrics. And, and I had severed, completely severed my tongue. Hmm. Uh, uh, half of it and I remember walking to the house holding it in my hand and and I I didn't have any fear I knew I just needed to get to an adult and the the result of that is now I'm in school and and it it had just started school had just started and this is this is the year that you have to you have to learn to read this is the year that your your creativity really blossoms and you're it's another level you move from from the the garden and you move into the we're going to develop the intellect into actually applying some of these things and and all of a sudden i had this massive step back except i didn't because i had a teacher named mrs rogers now when i got out of the marine corps many many years later and i was walking down on a levee in this city just enjoying the beauty of she, she was walking with a friend and she knew me the second she saw me even though i had aged and, and, and little David Taylor, little Mitiga, who couldn't speak, she would sit with me every single day. And she said, but you can learn how to read. And she took the time to teach me how to read. And I ended up, because of that, being able to read before anybody in my class. And it wasn't viewed as a special, you know, being treating any kid more special because she gave this unique time to every child. She viewed her day from start to finish as this race, her marathon. I still remember her saying this. I got into running about uh, about six years after that, 
And I still remember her saying, just start my marathon. And, and, and then artistry, she allowed me, she covered one of the back walls with white paper. And I, and I had a unique talent to be able to draw what I saw really well. And she would let me just draw. And, and what I found was that approach, which was not the approach I got at home. When I went home, it was, it was the dread that I had to leave this safe place. And in reality, that's what uh, for a lot of children, these places are. It's a safe place for them to have their personality blossom, where they're not fighting and competing for light, that everybody wants to shine the light on them. And, and so, uh, so when I left grade one, I actually was, was, I had read every single book in, I had won the, the school's uh, uh, reading club contest. I had read over 300 books. I'll never forget that. <laughs> and, and, and I was, had incredible artistry, but then I moved into second grade, grade two, and I had Mrs. Nedro and Mrs. Schur, and they wanted to focus on helping me pronounce things. So uh, they would let me work with the other kids. And this is the power of education in life. They would let me work with other kids on reading. Now, I couldn't say things properly, but I could, I could say them slowly, correctly. And I would help other kids read. But it, what it did is it helped me speak. And then I started speaking again in grade two. And then by grade five, I was standing up and giving almost giving full lectures to the class because the teachers, they all knew about me. And they just kept feeding the bear, right? The hungry bear. But they were doing this with other students as well in different ways. And I think this is that metamorphosis that occurred in education. And it probably, it probably originated with some of these ideas that you're talking about, Sarah and Henry, that originated over in Central Europe, which is a return to naturalism. The most natural environment is where would a kid have been 10,000 years ago? And how important would it have been for him to be or her to be in nature, to be around grown adults and around intermediate adults and learning about things and about themselves? Because the reality is going to come that at some point they're going to be on their own and they got to fly like an eagle or they're going to be an eagle running around, around on the ground. And people are going to say, why aren't you flying? You're an eagle. Well, maybe they just didn't know they were an eagle. And so that's for me. That's the power of education. And, and so when I think about my ability to speak now or my ability to write or read, and I, I just devour books, there isn't a single day that I don't have inside my heart a prayer of thankfulness for all the people that crossed my life to include Sarah Kuki, who, fin who opened me up into my final chapter was, hey, let's go talk about your family a little bit. Let's talk about your grandmother and let's talk about your tribe. And, and so even at the age of 40, I still had an educator see something in me, grab me and say, hey, you still have some more to go. And I think that's the journey that perhaps is your whole life. Powerful. Well, I hope it's not the final chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never is. We're only halfway through the book. Um, but, I, but I do think, that, yeah, we're talking about stories here and we're talking about language and, um, and, and empowering you to be able to go from being a child with a, um, with a, um, with a huge um, challenge there that actually has turned into being your strength. You've gone from si being silenced by an accident, as it were, to uh, developing that into um, the, the world of language. And, and you know, I, I, I'm very, very interested in this whole business of story. What is our story? You know, and, and that's the story told, as it were. And at the moment, we're going through the story that's unfolding um, so that we're able to sort of look to, to, to look at the future of what's our imagined story, right? And that's for me where we are in education, you know, what, what we need to be doing in, in nurturing everybody in education. And that's not the children alone. It's everybody that works in the school. Parents, parents as well. And the parents as well, and that that whole sense of community. But uh, one of the things that in international school education um, is quite challenging, and I know that again, Mide, this is something that you will relate to very deeply because of, um, uh, of, of what has happened to your people, is what happens when your own language is forbidden. 
and it's not about having an accident in your in, in, in your tongue not um, um, being able to, to to work for a while, but it's because um, you've you, your 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 own personal voice and language has been um, um, has been silenced. And I, I don't know. I'd I'd love to just try this. I'd I'd love to read from a very favourite book of mine by um, an amazing man uh, called John O'Donoghue that you may or may not know. Um, but he was a he was a Catholic priest in Ireland. And um, he was also a philosopher and he left the priesthood because he had differences of opinions on um, the openness of the church and the honesty of the church and, and the church's position on women. But he wrote this and it's short, but it's it, he wrote this little section about language and belonging. And this hugely influenced the way that we developed the single thing in campus um, uh, from a school that moved into a dual language. Uh, learning environment with English and German being valued alongside one another because we felt that the English language was somewhat imperialistic in its nature in that yeah. it became the language and is the language in, in many international schools of instruction sometimes at the cost of other languages yes and what came out of it because of the people I was working with and because they're just extraordinary educators who are searching for the imagined story while they're working through their unfolding stories was that we developed an, and, and, a, and an amazing woman by the name of uh, Ethne Gallagher who influenced us in, in moving towards an interlingual learning environment where if a child came in from Korea we didn't say you need to learn English and when you've got your English under your belt then you'll be able to access the curriculum. Um, we would buddy children up with one another. We would find ways of children being able to think in the language that <clears throat> was their home language. So you even, hold on, <clears throat> and you, you even brought in Korean language specialists, and you brought in Japanese language specialists, and Spanish language specialists, and French language specialists. These are people that I would communicate with, and you empowered. And this is the future of education globally empowering young people to be proud of who they are and that the entire structure around them supports it and says, let's go ahead and just add some gifts to your bag. Mm -hmm. so let's go ahead. That's right, because language is so tightly um, 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 connected to our personal identity and our cultural heritage, which is why when we're trying to oppress, we take it away. Right. from the whole people. So here's, here's John O'Donoghue. It's taken from Eternal um, Echoes, uh, exploring our hunger to belong. Language and belonging. Each language has a unique memory. The thoughts, whispers, and voices of a people live in their language. Gradually, over time, all the words grow together to build a language. The sound of the wind, the chorus of the tides, the silence of stone, love whispers in the night, the swell of delight and the sorrow of the darkness all come to find their echoes in the language. As it fills out, the language becomes the echo mirror of the people and their landscape. No one knows the secret color and the unique sound of the soul of a people like their language. A language is a magical presence. It is utterly alive because we use it every minute to feel and think and talk. We rarely stop to notice how strange and exciting words are. It's like the air, we cannot live one moment without it, yet we rarely think of it. The most vital center of your life is your mind. Your world is moored to your mind. Now there is no power that awakens and opens the mind like language does. Words form our minds and we can only see ourselves and the world through the lenses of words. As they age over centuries, words ripen with nuance and deeper levels of meaning. The memory of a people lives in the rich landscape of its language. Stories are at the very heart of what makes us human. 
We each have one, and we can learn and grow from listening to each other. The Listen podcast is an exploration of the stories of Americans abroad and how they got there. If you're curious about the world and hungry for community, check out their website at www.thelistenpodcast.com or their Facebook group at the Listen Podcast Community. You almost made me cry. You know, my grandmother struggled so badly with 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 that being on the bridge between two realities. You know, half her life she was to be ashamed. And then the other half it was okay, but she was afraid. And so the way I learned our language is through songs. And that's how a lot of them are learned. And that's why the, the powwow is kind of the place where you come together and it's very musical because that's where it, 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 it is now. But, but the, the future is full integration and, and everybody viewing each other as equal sitting at one table. We, you know, whether, and we call that the medicine wheel, the wheel of the circle of love. There's no, there's no elongated rectangular table where one person's at the front. No, it's a circle and everybody is an equal you know, and we, and it's, you know, red, yellow, black, and white, one family with one creator. And when you were saying, reading that, it, it almost made me cry because I thought of a song that my grandma sang all the time. And, and it's, and it was the first song I remembered. And then just this week, I, I actually had, I had forwarded to Henry and, and another elder, uh, a little short video of me catching Henry, my youngest son, Henry, playing in the room with his dinosaurs, but he was singing this song. And this song says, this is a prayer song, creator who lives in a place that is great to own, who makes things that are great and majestic. You know, hear my words and take my prayers and my wishes on the wind, like the eagle. And, and if you want to return that to me, then I'll receive it with gladness. And I, my little four-year-old son was singing this song. And, and that's the first thing I thought about is that the power of language, and clearly he knows what he's saying, just like he knows what he's saying in English, and just like when he knows what he's saying in German. And, and I just want to thank you for that poem, because I think everybody should be proud, very proud of their mother and their father and their grandmothers and grandfathers. And, and even if they're bridging many continents, because it's really one home, Carl Sagan, the little blue dot. That's right. And we're all here in this most sacred place amidst the void of darkness. And it's because of healers, healers of the heart, like you, Sarah, and like you, Henry, that I feel super excited about the future. But if it's okay, before we end it, I would love to share this song with you. I hadn't planned it, mm -hmm. but I, I heard my son, Henry, as you were reading that. And I just want to tell you how much in my heart how much you have meant to my family and my life with the work that you've done and what I learned in my, my two years with the international school and what I, what I gathered and brought to my children and my family that I did not get from, from my immediate family because they were suffering with generational trauma. And so for me, a lot of healing came from seeing what was occurring with these youth that I saw grow from the nest that's what they call it the nest the lowest part the nest like like little babies and they nurture them just incredibly all the way to those that were graduating and in and, and meeting with me at the model united nations that they hosted at the school and these these great uh, 12 seniors that are talking at a level that i when i was in my master's degree program i didn't meet people that were that intelligent <laughs> so they must be <laughs> something right but uh, thank you, and I and I would love before we uh, we do end to just to share that song with you. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I I grew up in international schools around the world, and what's really interesting to me about that lifestyle, that world. I I, I grew up in a difficult home environment as well, and like me, day school was my refuge, and the extended family that you make amongst friends and teachers who become like parental figures. Uh, this is something I saw echoed in, in Waldorf schools as well, that the teacher ideally stays with the same constellation of children from first through eighth grade, right? So that you're, they're taking an almost parental responsibility for the education of these particular individuals. 
and allowing them to be individuals. One of the things that I'm so excited about with our current technological advances with social media, I know a lot of people criticize it because it, you know, it does generate a lot of, uh, you know, misinformation and so forth. But what for me it's done is that it's bridged me back to my foundational community from the American school, specifically in Brazil, the international school that I went to. And we have a, a WhatsApp group. We talk daily and we have Zoom little mini reunions and we're now reconnected. And all the things that we loved about each other as children, we still love about each other, understanding that our biographies are exponentially broader since that time. And nobody expects anyone else to be as they were. Each individual is embraced as they are with the memory of that connection early on. You know, we talk about the origins of, of contemporary mainstream education having come out of the Industrial Revolution, where children were, were taken out of nature and put into factories. They were taken off of farms and put into factories and the whole system was mechanized and replicated around the world to dehumanize and to take their childhood, that wonder away and leave it to parents to provide that balance. But many parents, as we have acknowledged, are deficient in those essential life skills that they are almost solely responsible for teaching their children because they are now no longer with, you know, I mean, obviously they're still manufacturing, but now children are being trained and mechanized for cubicles in corporate buildings. You could be on a floor in a high rise amongst how many hundreds of other workers and you know nothing of the biographies of the people you're working with, sitting next to and sharing a mission with. One of the things about uh, Steiner that I really appreciate is that the first year, the foundation year, of a teacher training is in their own biography. It's the best tool that you could possibly teach from. Mide, you teach from your own biography every day, not only with your own children, but with all of us by sharing your story, right? What do we remember of our, of our school days and our, and our youth? We remember, as you said, our teachers. We remember the stories and the songs and the poems of our childhood. We remember art, we remember how we felt whether it was sad or happy, embarrassed, we can pinpoint all the way back to the age of six and seven years old, right? What do we remember of our academic lessons? I would venture to say very, very little. So that also expresses the importance of foundational education and really laser focusing for the future, not only in schools, but also in homes. This is the importance of parent education. Talk a little bit, Sarah, about your experience with parent education in an international school environment, because I find well, it fascinating. Well, well I want to I want to cut in here because as a parent who was influenced by Sarah before mm. she cut, you know, my entire like my and in, in Henry, you've seen the pictures. The, my entire walls are covered with probably sixty or seventy amazing artists, and we just added three more today. It's like wallpaper. We, <laughs> we have a little. Is literally wallpaper. And we have a little educational center where I have the art supplies and I have the things that allows them to go and be created. I learned that from the International School of Stuttgart. I learned that from Sarah Kuki and her amazing team of professionals and how they were helping children grow in ways that 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 I, I that that I did as a kid, but at another level. And then and I provide that opportunity for my own children. And so, you know, as Sarah goes, I'm a living example of the outcome that just peripherally you can cross paths with people and, and influence them to change and, and, and to be more helpful. So Sarah, take off and what caused this thing to flourish as it has, because I'm not the only one, I'm one of thousands and thousands. I, I, you know, I thank you for that. I, I think the, you know, fundamentally, um, um, Friedrich Froebel used to talk in terms of um, the child being like an onion and you need to peel away the layers of, of finding the child within and uh, it was it was really about there's this lovely word um, in German entfalten 
and it's to um, unfold, I suppose, is, is that we, we unfold as human beings and as, as, um, as, as our sense of wonder as young children, uh, where everything happens the first time and we're experiencing everything the first time. And I think parents, um, particularly the parents that I've worked with for the last 30 years, have been, um, many of them outside of the Waldorf School and in international schools, are pe people on the move quite a lot. Yeah. And they don't have their network of families with them, of extended family or, or the friends that they um, have, have normally had uh, in, you know, nearby. And <clears throat> so they're really dependent on the school being their focus. Um, it's where they meet one another and um, guide one another in uh, their children unfolding. Um, but there's often quite a tension there of have we done the right thing by our uh, our children if we if we move to another country and we're doing this for the career and then one of the parents is always away because they've been traveling around the world I think uh, the pandemic has helped us to realize that that may not be quite as necessary as we had maintained it to be beforehand but it's all about relationship building and so I think the the, the work with parents was really about being able to create a sense of belonging being able to create a sense of trust. And you, you can't just do that by saying those words. You have to um, demonstrate that um, what you're doing with children in school is not an experiment that might or might not work out all right. It's truly a belief in the um, unfolding of that child. And where other systems, um, national systems around the world might have a heavy focus on, let's make sure that we've got the maths, the writing, the reading sorted out, you know, science is going to be Im Im important and we'll make those our focus. Uh, and the other things are nice to have. Um, the International Baccalaureate is all about the fact that no, we need a balance. And, and we fundamentally believe that, but helping parents to understand we're not experimenting. We know this to be, <laughs> We know this to be the best thing for your child. And I can say that, you know, having um, fortunately um, um, headed up the team for 17 years, I actually did have the experience of children coming in as young children and then seeing them go out mm. at graduation, which I had never had before. And seeing what happens to these children and the alumni coming back to talk and to, I, you know, I, I spend my summer holidays sitting, having lots of coffee with people that come back to Sindelfing and to come and have a chat and tell me where they are now. And to see children that one might have thought when they were little that they're going to have some real challenges academically. Um, but because they weren't only channeled in these so-called academic subjects, the core subjects, but they also learned how to sew on their own buttons and how to embroider and how to knit and how to plant plants and nurture them and how to get their hands really dirty. I remember this one little girl standing there as she'd been painting and her hands were all covered in the paint that she was spreading over her fingers and watching. And then she she saw how and and she looked a bit worried in case I was going to tell her off because she wasn't doing what she was meant to be doing but it was just wonderful to see her watching this material in this case paint and see what happened as her hands warmed it and it started to cake against the skin and so there was the soft um, and, and you see this when, when children are pot potting with, with clay mm. to experiment and feel and understand how materials work and so forth. For parents to understand the value of that and to be able to play with their children and allow their children to play and not to hover over them, but to allow them to entfalten, to unfold, mm. I think um, was what won the trust and the relationship. Hi, I'm Yvonne Johansson, and this is My Little House. My Little House is an interactive, multi-sensory, educational felt toy that I invented to help develop children's language skills. I love My Little House. I've been working as a speech therapist for over 20 years. So then I just thought, wouldn't it be great if I could just take this one-dimensional board and make it into an actual three-dimensional toy? How cool would that be? 
That's the idea behind My Little House. You can spread it out flat like a four panel felt board or here's the cool part. In the blink of an eye, My Little House easily converts into a three dimensional reversible house. My Little House comes with 36 felt cut out pieces that match outlines in eight colorful rooms. And they're felt so they stick. Each piece inside My Little House has been placed with purpose. But My Little House isn't just for kids on the spectrum or with significant disorders. It's also for typically developing two to five year olds. It's a fun toy. I always say to my kids, when you get stuck, you have to ask for help. Can you tell me what you see on top of the refrigerator? I know that My Little House is going to make a difference in thousands of children's lives. I just need your help in getting it out there. Thank you so much for listening. For more information about My Little House, My Little Farm, My Little Zoo, and other Smart Felt Toys, visit www.smartfelttoys.com. And that's, and that's my prayer for the people that I descend from, who I, I was just speaking with an elder two days ago who said, we don't know how to educate. The model we were given doesn't work. It came from overseas and they're just coming out of this. And I said, well, those that brought you that model, they've returned to their roots and they're actually capable of teaching us how to be who we were originally. And these are concepts that we should, we should embrace. And so I look forward to in the future, bringing the tremendous information from, from people like you who've changed my life as a father. And, and back to my people back in, in primarily Canada and the Great Lake region of the United States to say, hey, there's another educational model out there. And this model is more traditional and more natural and more beneficial. And, and it's sort of like comparing uh, economic models, right? This one works. Well, one of the things that I really uh, was, was brought back to was um, my son's first year, first grade year at the Waldorf School. And every child starts by carving their own knitting needles and sharpening the points and then gluing a bead to the ends of them. They card the wool, they harvest the wool and they card the wool and they dye the wool. And over the entire first year, they learn to knit. I'll always remember the, the little verse, in through the front door, run around the back, peek through the window and off jumps Jack, right? And my son, Cameron, taught me how to knit with that verse. So he would come home and practice knitting. Um, and the knitting he was doing in school was kept at school, but we did more at home and he practiced. And it was so amazing to look at the scarf at the end of his first year of school because at the beginning of it, it's all kind of wild and loose and confused and not really clear where it was going. But gradually over the entire year, this one scarf that they knit over the entire year became more formed, became more conscious, more focused and cleaner stitches. And uh, it was just a beautiful, beautiful example of what we're talking about here. If you take the time and effort to allow a child to unfold, and if you see them, if you create art with them, whether it's textile art or whether it's drawing or painting, right? Even with music or theater, you're going to see their development and you'll have a document of their development that they can look back and learn from because it's theirs, it's their biography that then they can pass on to their children or if they don't have children of their own, other children who are in their lives. It's really a beautiful gesture. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's incredible the, the power. What are some practical tools, uh, Sarah and Mide, both of you, that you've been able to find that we can share with our audience. We have, we have listeners in 30 countries around the world and growing. And so we understand that there are going to be different barriers that parents experience, whether it's cultural or whether it's a, a government institution uh, of education that their children are in. And they have, they feel, and I, I experience in the, in the States, parents feel very little control. So I guess what um, I would say, yeah, how, 
power of 15 minutes. You know, to a child who has a, a, a real short lifespan and a lot, a lot of experiences, 15, 30 minutes can be extraordinary amount of time. And, and I think even as an adult, we forget this until somebody says, hey, go sit in the chair and count to 300. That's just five minutes. And they just lose their mind. <laughs> so be aware of the power of time. And then also be aware of the, the power of growth. What, it, what is it that your child really needs to do, wants to do, and can grow from? And I would say it's age specific, but I'd say for me coming with the, the young boys in the, in the early years, I would say it's, it's, it's encouraging creativity, just creativity. Give them the space to be creative involve yourself but step back and see what they do and let them do it let them do it and when they make a mistake and they spill the paint or they get it on their shirt okay pause and take a breath okay take a breath laugh about it okay you can replace a shirt you can't replace a bad memory so don't make something that can be positive negative when it doesn't have to be Beautiful. Sarah? Yeah, and I would say, you know, we know an awful lot about learning in between times, and I think it is about making connections. It's being able to connect our new knowledge, skills, and understandings with what we already have in our toolkit, and um, making sure that we really honor and value what's in that toolkit. When children, when young children make observations that sound kind of cute, I think we need to be careful about not making it cute. I think we need to really respect what young children observe and see because they then have the courage to make those connections with their next things. So, you know, knowledge is quickly learned. It's also quickly forgotten, but it's quickly learned. Skills take a lot of practice and it's messy and you have to get it wrong before you can get it right again and before you can improve upon it. And understanding takes a lot longer. There's a, I, 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 there's a beautiful um, example of this when Glenn Gould was playing the, uh, uh, um, you know, this uh, concert pianist was playing uh, uh, the Goldberg Variations. And uh, on the CD that, uh, uh, that I was listening to, there was a recording of him um, playing the Goldberg um, uh, Variations. And then again, I think it was 25 years later. And this absolutely brilliant um, recital the 25 years beforehand but that I would describe as being knowledge and skill based and when you hear it again 25 years later it's about understanding because it's given depth one of the things that Steiner used to talk about was having time to digest our learning and um, I think for parents I completely understand their anxiety about but is my child ever going to get there? What happens if there are gaps? People are talking about gaps in children's learning in national systems all over the world. Right. I cannot accept that young people have gaps in their learning. They've all been learning during this time. They simply haven't been learning the things that we want to test them on at the end of our national um, um, education system or as our international baccalaureate system all we're saying is we've decided these are the things that are important for students to know and if they haven't learned them then we can't test them on them they haven't got gaps in their learning they've been learning something different that's right and the thing about truth is that if it's true somewhere it's true everywhere the things that they're learning are important too they need to make those connections so i think for parents to be able to trust and I, I know that's easily said and uh, um, you know perhaps um, um, but I but I must say that when when we were a small new school we had a lot of anxious parents worrying about whether we were experimenting with their children I in my current job I spend a lot of time talking with heads of schools around the world and there are a lot of anxious parents I have to say in the last 10 years we rarely had parents showing any anxieties or worrying at all because they had enough trust in what was happening and conversations with other parents um, to be able to trust in the system that they um, were able to extend that to a point that they were able to say, good, okay, we will go with you and we will see what happens uh, in the development of our child because our child is happy. 
Our child is evidently learning. Our child is making connections, is coming home with ideas and developing them further. Um, I don't think it's the content that is nearly as important as the big picture and the openness to, to exploring our curiosity. Your generous sponsorship and individual support of the Lost Traveler podcast benefits the Lost Travelers Club, a charitable project under the fiscal sponsorship of United Charitable, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. The Lost Travelers Club focuses primarily on the needs of parents who have outlived their beloved children. We recently launched our new Brain Candy Project wing, providing art supplies to children still struggling with critical or terminal health-related conditions. We hope to raise enough funds to launch Brain Candy, an arts and literature magazine created by and for these young people. Find out more at www.braincandy.online. Thank you. Beautiful. Absolutely. Right. And, and, you know, the other thing, too, is that, Mide, you're an example of, is that it's never too late to reclaim your education. We all have an inner child. We're all babies in one way or another. Nobody's yeah. an expert in everything. And likewise, children, as adults have inner ch children that we get to raise now, right? Because our parents maybe didn't have a full toolkit to meet who we were individually. We have that opportunity now to elevate our skill set. We can find the experts. That's what this podcast is all about, is finding these experts so that we can ramp up our individual skills as we see them and address our own deficiencies. Likewise, I believe that children possess an inner adult. Nobody's talking about that. Children understand instinctively because they are so connected to themselves and their sponges for absorbing what's around them, right? That, that they can sort out to a degree. I think that's what you're, you're talking about, Sarah, is that they are constantly learning. Whether we're putting them in a box or not, they are learning. Universal life skills means that these are the skills that every human being, almost 8 billion on the planet now, are learning. These are things like communication skills, emotional literacy, financial literacy. I don't care if you're living in a, a penthouse apartment in Manhattan and trading on Wall Street, or if you're living in a mud hut in the Republic of Congo trading six eggs for a handful of rice. Trade is trade and you're learning the same skills. The question is not whether we are learning, it's how well are we learning these skills and from whom. Many young people today are finding life skills education on their own, on the internet. They're looking for videos on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. And, and it's not only dangerous for children, I believe, uh, it's like dropping them off in the red light district, uh, <laughs> you know, without any supervision. It's so important for parents to understand that they have a responsibility to put some form around their children's use of technology. Because as Steiner said, within form, there is freedom. I absolutely agree. You know, in, in, you know before a redwood tree was ever a redwood tree. These are these giant trees in California. Blew right. my mind when I saw one. You know, there were these little seeds, but they were fully a redwood genetically inside that seed. And, and that's what you're talking about with these, these young adults. And even you in the, in the middle and older, you're constantly learning, constantly growing. You're not there yet. You're not the full redwood tree yet. Now, Sarah, you talked a little bit about truth. You know, we, from what I learned from my grandmother, is that kindness is the power and peace and the most powerful kindness is to speak the truth. Now, Henry, you talked about that inner child. You know, our seven grandfather teachings, these were these, the teachings of our grandfathers from a long time ago that, that said for you to be able to experience life in a harmonious way, then inwardly you need to grow in these areas. And you have to do it as a child you know, the messenger who gave it, he said, each one of us is a child. We must apply these teachings in our lives. 
and place our trust in them. And you cannot have one without the other. And so if it's okay, I'd love to share these, these ancient teachings that, uh, that every concept you'll see exist in the three-year-old, in the 20-year-old, in the 75-year-old, just being a nice man, uh, you know, buying some bread at the store, right? They figured something else that we're still trying to learn, right? When we get mad in the car, it cuts us off on the highway. In reality, all that happened is a metal box moved in front of you, right? So if you, if you would allow, I'd like to share these. Please do. Okay. So love. Knowing love is to know peace. Our love must be unconditional. And when people are weak or flawed, we must love them the most. For one to love and accept themselves and others is to be at peace with themselves in harmony with all creation. Respect. Honor creation is to show respect. There is no part of creation that should be excluded from the honor we are to give. Give value to all people and all things. Be courteous, considerate, and appreciative. Bravery. Use your personal strengths to face difficulty. Stand tall in adversity and make positive choices and have the courage in thinking and speaking. And be ceaselessly brave. I learned that from the International School of Stuttgart in Syracuse. Truth. Have knowledge of your culture and act without regret in that regard. Understand, speak, and feel truth and to honor its power. We know who we are in our heart. Our emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual gifts guide us in our journey for truth. Honesty. Facing a situation and being brave and having the courage to do the right thing and say it allows truth to be our guide. Be honest with yourself first and then with others. Walk with integrity. Humility, to know you are a part of a big creation. You're not alone. There are others in this journey with you. And to see yourself as equal to others, even children or elderly. You are no better or worse, so have compassion, calmness, meekness, gentleness, and patience. Wisdom. Mixing all these teachings with experiences in life is wisdom. We are asked to be used for good. So use intelligence, knowledge, and separate these inner qualities and relationships so you can have good sense and a positive attitude. And wisdom comes in all shapes, sizes, forms, and ages. Even my four-year-old teaches me wisdom. And then you'll find true kindness. And that's when you can deal equally because of this experience and this wisdom with the widow, beggar, and orphan as you do with your spouse, brother, and children. And these are these seven teachings that we say will help us to, to educate others in this world. But what I also learned from the International School of Stuttgart and with Sarah Kupke as a, as a human being is that, that we're not the only ones that carry this magical message of unity. And so I just wanted to say once again, thank you for impacting and changing my life, Sarah, and continuing to do so. And I know you're doing it for many other people, as well as you, Henry. Well, now you're doing it for people in 30 countries. Um, and thank you for that. I'll put a link to the Pembina Chippewa uh, website uh, in the description, listeners, and there will be a list of the seven grandfather teachings. Sarah, uh, before we wrap up, um, First of all, thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom um, and your heart because it is so, I feel it even through the machine. Um, and I, I hope we have many future conversations like this. Um, there was something that you were going to share with us uh, that I'd like to invite you to, to bring. Um, let me say thank you very much to you, both of you. Yes, certainly, certainly our conversations will continue. Henry and uh, you know we, we just may not record the ones in future but it was an absolute honor to have uh, been part of this conversation I thank you um yeah if if you have time um, for this then uh, this is a this is a piece um, of prose which uh, is written by um, a Franciscan monk his name is Richard raw he's um, uh, an American and um, he's talking about being on the edge of the inside. And I think this is what we've, what we've all been talking about in um, embracing life in a way that is not um, um, stuck in a doctrine, 
and um, rule bound, uh, but it's about unfolding. Um, but it's also about recognizing the privilege of not necessarily being um, ensconced in um, a belief system that has no flexibility about it. Um, so, so for what it's worth, I'd love to just read this because I, it's a beautiful piece of writing and it's um, from a, um, a piece that he called On the Edge of the Inside, the Prophetic Position, Richard Raw. The edge of things is a liminal space, a very sacred place where guardian angels are especially available and needed. The edge is a holy place, or as the Celts called it, a thin place. And you have to be taught how to live there. To take your position on the spiritual edge of things is to learn how to move safely in and out, back and forth, across and return. The position on the edge of things is not a rebellious or an antisocial one. When you live on the edge of the inside of anything with respect and honor, you are in a very auspicious and advantageous, advantageous position. You're free from its central seductions, but are also free to hear its core message in a very new and creative way. When you're at the center of something, you usually confuse the essentials with the non-essentials and get tied down by the trivia, loyalty tests and security. Not much truth can happen there. But if you're both inside and outside, you are an ultimate threat, a possible reformer, and a lasting invitation to a much larger world. And I read that to our 10th graders at their graduation ceremony in, in June. And um, I believe we are people who are living on the edge um, uh, on the edge, edge of the inside, and it's a privileged position to be in. Um, and I thank you very, very much for having the opportunity to, to talk today. Oh, it's <laughs> wonderful. And that was absolutely a, a perfect passage to read. My theater company is called The Liminos Project for that reason, that we that's exactly what we're about. So listeners, I will put a link to that as well in the description. So Mide, close us out, co-host, with Absolutely. something special. Like these words into the sky like the eagle and, and, and through all of creation, in the earth, outside of the earth, we're all bound, we're all connected. So this is me and my little boy's song, who's standing here right here with me right now. Aya geche da we, aya geche da, aya geche da we, aya geche da, bushke agin, bushke agin, ya we ya, ya we ya, bushke agin, bushke agin. Aya geche da we, aya geche da, aya geche da we, aya geche da, bushke agin, bushke agin, ya we ya, ya we ya, bushke agin, bushke agin, miigwech, thank you. Miigwech, Mide, and Miigwech, Sarah, as well. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Uh, go back, if you haven't already, and check out, uh, this is a, an ongoing series. Check in whatever platform that you uh, prefer, and, um, and we'll see you next week. Thank you again. You've been listening to season two of the Lost Traveler podcast with Henry Cameron Allen. Visit me online at www.henryallen.org. Thank you to my guests and thank you for tuning in. Let's keep striving for a better world together.